Okay, so uh, good morning again, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are joining us from. Uh, let me welcome you very specially to the September 2023 Union of Africa Population Scientist Seminar on Family Planning Session and Reproductive Health. Uh, today, we are privileged to have Dr. Jason Bremer, uh, who is the Senior Director of Data Measurement at Family Planning 2030. Uh, he will be talking to us on family planning measurements and advancement. My name is Akone Akiemi. I'm the chair of the panel, and um, I also have Dr. Estelle uh, Sitsi from APHRC as the co-chair of this panel. Uh, we gave our special appreciation to Bill Amida Gates Foundation, uh, the Gates Foundation at John Hopkins University, Baltimore, and Maryland for providing support uh, to this panel. So let me read a brief about Dr. Justin Bremer, uh, so then uh, he can take it off from there. So George, Dr. Jason Bremer, uh, PhDMPH, is Family Planning 2030 Data and Measurement Senior Director. Uh, he joined the FP2020 Secretariat uh, with over 15 years of professional experience providing technical leadership on research translation, policy analysis, data for decision making, and individual and institutional capacity building. Jason was the Associate Vice President for International Programs, Programs Director for Population, Health, and Environment, and the Deputy Director for the USAID funded PACE project, a Population Reference Bureau, uh, PRP. He received his PhD from the University of North Carolina, and that's an MPH in Global Health from Emory University. He also has a wealth of direct country experience in many of the FP2020 focused countries, particularly in Africa, including Ethiopia, Kenya. Uh, Rwanda, Tanzania, Uganda, and also outside Africa in Nepal and the Philippines. So as Data and Performance Management Director, Jesse is leading efforts to embed the use of data and performance management approaches through a performance monitoring and analysis of the FP2020 movement to provide trusted and transparent information regarding progress towards reaching the FP2020 goals and strengthening accountability for implementation of financial policy and programming commitments made by the country governments, donors, and the UN, uh, and other stakeholders. So it's my honor today to uh, give the floor to Justin. Justin, please, you have the honor. J Justin will talk to us then. Uh, please, if you have question and questions, you can just put in the question uh, uh, from Justin, please, you have the floor. Thank you, Akani. Uh, a pleasure to join you, and thank you. Uh, for the invitation from this uh, UAPS panel. I've been uh, watching uh, from afar as this UAPS panel on FP and SRHR uh, has been active over the, the past several uh, months, and I've been able to join some of the webinars. Uh, Akani and I know each other <clears throat> uh, from the FP 2030 Performance Monitoring and Events Working Group, so it's uh, also uh, my honor to to join you and to have a Connie as a member of that group. Uh, I'll give a, a bit of a history of, uh, of the FP2020 measurement uh, agenda and how that has transitioned uh, into the work that we're doing now as FP2030. And I will, I'll try to uh, bring up some of the challenges ahead and how FP2030 is working uh, with partners on uh, advancing family planning measurement and try to spark a discussion here about um, how members of UAPS, um, IUSSP, ICFP um, can participate in advancing family planning measurement. Uh, <clears throat> Akani mentioned the, the question and answer uh, panel. The chat is also live, so please feel free to uh, introduce yourselves to one another in the chat. I always uh, encourage a lively discussion in the chat. I have some colleagues who are on uh, who will help me with uh, posting some links to resources in the chat as well. Uh, and <clears throat> I do know that um, interpretation is available. So for those who speak French, please do use the interpretation at the bottom of the uh, navigation bar. And uh, I hope to have a relatively short presentation so we can have lots of uh, back and forth and lots of questions. Great to see uh, friends and colleagues 
old and new online. So I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, next slide, please. So I want to, <clears throat> before I talk about the, the future advances and the future work ahead of us, I want to look back and uh, give some context of where I think we have come from, where we have made improvements, um, and acknowledge where we haven't. So uh, let me first talk a bit about uh, some of the FP2020 measurement successes. Next slide, please. I like to um, I like to think back to my years at Population Reference Bureau before I joined FP2020, uh, working with decision makers on uh, looking at data, communicating data, working with advocates and researchers on communicating their findings. And I have to say that we and I felt somewhat limited at the time um, to the data that was periodically available um, with national health surveys, such as the demographic health survey, the multiple indicator cluster survey. I remember working uh, in, in Kenya ahead of the demographic health survey in which we hadn't had data uh, since 2008 and were waiting a long time for the next survey. And there was this story of stall in Kenya family planning stall that many probably here know well and better than I do. And then we waited. We said, are we, we made changes. We worked on priority setting <clears throat> and the government did prioritize family planning, but we didn't have a lot of data to determine whether things had changed. And it was years until we got that next family planning uh, survey uh, before we could really confirm whether things had uh, indeed changed. And I think that that story, that experience of mine uh, was repeated over uh, many countries and has been repeated for a long time in the family planning community. And I'll say, while we had family planning service statistics from HMIS systems, um, their quality was often called into uh, question. Their coverage was often incomplete. So we knew that not all um, service delivery points were reporting. And because of those quality and coverage issues, uh, the service statistics were not used consistently. And then finally, there was there were a lot of indicators in which different partners, uh, different surveys were using uh, different different definitions, slight um, adapt adaptations of indicators and, uh, it was difficult to look across countries or even over time um, at particular indicators and compare countries or compare a country over time. So I like to think of this as, uh, uh, you know, this is much of our history. I'm not saying that family planning ha um, hasn't benefited from a great amount of investment in those demographic health surveys, in those systems, but I think we had a period where we, we got to a point um, and we weren't seeing much advancement. So then that is the context, I think, you know, pre-FP2020 um, and pre-investments, some additional investments in data. Next slide, please. With the launch of the FP2020 goal and the FP2020 partnership, um, there was a, an explicit desire to monitor progress towards that FP2020 goal of 120 million additional users of modern contraception across 69 uh, focused countries at that time, the uh, the poorest countries in the world. And a set of, uh, of core indicators was established to provide an annual uh, global readout of key progress that would be comparable, it would be applicable and available across countries and, and comparable. So there was a set of core indicators established. Uh, this was established by um, a, an expert measurement group uh, that became the Performance Monitoring and Evidence Working Group that still exists today, and I'll talk a bit more about them later. Uh, this kind of reporting could be done at, um, you could think of doing this at a global level. The UN POP division often produces estimates across countries, uh, but that doesn't guarantee that country partners and countries own that data um, and feel like they understand where the data came from. So we want to establish a different 
type of process from that of a sort of global reporting. And so we established a country-led process for reviewing data, assessing progress, and reporting that um, to FP 2020. And that <clears throat> resulted in a, an annual FP 2020 progress report, summarizing key, clo key global and regional data and, and measurement findings. Uh, prior to this, we did have reports such as the uh, the UNFPA State of the World Population Report, but the State of the World Population Report is not a deep dive into family planning. It is a, a look at a broader set of uh, indicators of, and not specifically diving into very important aspects of family planning programs that help uh, countries to assess progress, assess method availability, method mix, and many others. And I'll look, we'll look at those, those country uh, or core indicators in a moment. In addition to all this work on family planning data, uh, there was a desire to improve the tracking of family planning financing. The next slide. <clears throat> the FP 2020 in core indicators uh, included uh, 18 indicators with some sub parts. Um, many of you are probably familiar that we were uh, tracking at that time additional users of modern contraception across the 69 countries and aggregating that to assess progress towards that, that additional users goal. But at a country level, countries were really um, assessing a different set of indicators. These other indicators that were really part of their national program goals uh, of the FP 2020 commitments that they established, and those included modern contraceptive prevalence goals. It included um, desires to expand uh, method mix and a method availability, uh, indicators on stockouts. Uh, it included uh, indicators on the CYPs or a couple of years of protection that encouraged the use and examination of service statistics. Uh, it included uh, proxies for quality of information and, and counseling that clients were receiving, <clears throat> and additional indicators looking at uh, impact of, uh, of contraceptive use on um, averting unintended pregnancies, maternal deaths, unsafe abortions. <clears throat> and finally, understanding continuation and discontinuation uh, as well as switching of contraceptive use. So these were the uh, 18 core indicators that we monitored uh, during the 2012 to 2020 uh, era and that we produced an annual report on each year through that country led and bottom up process. Next slide, please. This bottom up process was uh, established uh, by the Track 20 project at Avenir Health, a key partner in the uh, FP 2020 uh, data and measurement agenda, uh, and a series of Track 20 M&E officers at a country level who were uh, aggregating data, analyzing data, uh, using statistical models to uh, take all past surveys uh, and service statistics into account to produce annual estimates of key indicators. Uh, and, and then bringing that together um, in around the May to July period each year for data consensus meetings in which partners, stakeholders, and family planning programs in countries would review progress uh, discuss um, whether there had been progress, whether there were challenges, uh, shift priorities, talk about advocacy um, and policy changes that might be needed, uh, and ultimately um, <clears throat> then report that data to FP uh, to to Track Twenty and FP Twenty Twenty so that we could produce that global report. There's always been an acknowledgement that the Core indicators are not sufficient uh, on their own to assess progress. Uh, they are an encouragement. They are a they are essentially the building blocks of of producing this annual report and the process for discussing data uh, at a country level. We know countries should be diving deeper into their service statistics. We sh they should be looking at particular program priorities around social behavior change programs around demand creation, around adolescents and youth, 
around <clears throat> postpartum uh, and post-abortion family planning. Um, so these are not sufficient. The core indicators are not. And the core indicators weren't without their, their problems and their challenges. Uh, and so recognizing that the uh, that the annual measurement report is is not complete, um, I think that sparks a question of um, if it isn't complete um, and if there are still challenges, then how do we overcome those? Next slide, please. Well, one thing that we um, have always done is talk about those measurement challenges um, and measurement advancements in each uh, family planning uh, 2030 progress report uh, and measurement report. Here you see uh, screen grabs or, or the cover images of each of the FP uh, 2020 and now the FP 2030 reports. Um, I have worked on these, uh, gosh, I can actually start counting them now if I, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've, I've worked on seven of these and uh, my team is uh, working with uh, Track 20 and the Track 20 m and &E officers on the 2023, 2023 um, report, which we will release uh, later this year or early next year. And in each of these, we do uh, an aggregation, uh, a sort of general overview look at, um, at family planning progress. We also bring up those measurement challenges. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> This annual reporting process has led to um, opportunities to examine data in, in new and different ways. Um, one of the things that we have really talked about uh, quite a bit is the growth in contraceptive users. Um, and that's not just talking about the number of additional users. It's talking about the base of contraceptive users that programs need to serve uh, each year, just even to stay steady. Um, even if contraceptive prevalence stalls, in the case of uh, of Kenya that I talked about in the in the two thousand eight period or those mid two thousands, it stalled in terms of prevalence. But a reminder that the population of women of reproductive age was uh, still growing, um, and so the number of contraceptive users that programs needed to serve was not staying steady. It was actually growing during that time. And this is the case for all of the FP uh, 2020 countries and FP 2030 countries now. So we wanted to bring light to the fact that even in a country like Nigeria, where growth has been slow in terms of prevalence change, uh, the total number of contraceptive users that that program is serving each year um, is growing, uh, and is expanding. The resources needed, the the contraceptive supplies needed, the personnel uh, needed, all uh, continue to grow. And so this is something that we uh, feel like we brought to the conversation and continue to bring to the conversation. Um, and it's just an evidence of how we use the measurement report to bring light to important uh, critical issues. Next slide, please. I hope many of you are familiar with the um, S-curve pattern of contraceptive prevalence growth that became um, an important conceptual discussion about what countries could expect in terms of uh, growth in contraceptive prevalence over time with, uh, with different expectations as uh, countries grow into a high prevalence, um, into this high prevalence range that they shouldn't expect uh, growth rates to continue to um, accelerate, that things generally slow down when you get to high prevalence and, and that when you get to higher levels of prevalence, your priorities need to shift. You may need to start focusing on uh, marginalized populations, uh, on uh, a different method mix, on sustainable financing. So th those kind of priorities may be very different from the priorities of a country that has had traditionally uh, low prevalence and uh, where there's an opportunity to, to start to <clears throat> work on social norms uh, and on supplies as well. And so we really feel like these are the types of um, concepts that we have continually explored 
um, and that with track 20 have, you know, seen countries use this to think about priorities. Um, so we we use the measurement report to bring focus to this, uh, but it's also being discussed at a country level, as I mentioned, in terms of data use and priority setting. Next slide, please. The FP 2020 uh, measurement report, as I um, as I discussed earlier, uh, focused on improved tracking of financial data. Uh, and together with uh, many finance partners, we have focused on uh, donor disbursements for family planning, domestic expenditures for family planning, um, and how those relate to one another. And here you see the work of the Kaiser uh, Family Foundation, or KFF, on donor disbursements uh, for family planning. And the level of the bar or the height of the bar shows the total donor disbursements, uh, bilateral disbursements for family planning from 2012 to 2021, which was the, the last year, um, last year's report, the period we had financing data for. And you can see these fluctuations. Um, we also break this down by uh, by government donor, and you can see the <clears throat> the color bars relating to different donors. This is available in our uh, measurement report. You can toggle, it is interactive. You can toggle the different donors and look at the amounts. I'm not going to get into the, the fluctuations um, right now. If you feel like asking questions about that, please do. But again, this focus on this um, brings to light the fact that even you know over this period of 2012 to 2021, we've really not seen um, large increases in uh, donor financing for family planning. Um, while at the same time, we have been articulating in that previous graphic on total users that countries are serving approximately 90 million more women each year uh, with modern contraceptive methods. So how is that happening? Where is that financing come, coming from? Are donors uh, keeping up? Are countries keeping up? That's a, a kind of conversation that this sparks and that we hope to continue to spark through the annual uh, reporting of progress. Next slide, please. <clears throat> FP2020 also, as I mentioned, acknowledged that a lot more work needed to be done on measurement um, I mentioned some of the successes, uh, but the uh, the performance monitoring and evidence working group um, established a forward-looking measurement um, agenda for family planning, uh, met regularly, uh, biannually, uh, to continue to advance measurement, focused on measurement alignment. I mentioned that there were different partners in different countries measuring data in different ways which made comparison challenging. Um, and, and I mentioned also that the group highlighted continued measurement challenges. Uh, next slide, please. This uh, collection of images to the right illustrates some of the products of that work uh, of convening the performance monitoring and evidence working group, discussing challenges, um, writing, commentaries, uh, working on publications to bring light to measurement challenges and ways forward, uh, working on indicator alignment <clears throat> so that uh, partners might, you know, or we would make recommendations on a on the best way to uh, to to measure something and then look to surveys to um, to change to adapt to those recommendations. So that's included indicator improvement, uh, new DHS questions. Uh, and these have been implemented in different ways, sometimes commentary, sometimes articles, sometimes specific recommendations into the DHS uh, questionnaire improvement portal. Um, and uh, and also new ways of reporting and communicating uh, data on our in our own report uh, and in our uh, dashboards and, and other resources. Next slide, please. I'll ask my uh, colleague, uh, Yasin Bai, who is uh, online with us and in the chat to, uh, to post some resources. Uh, we, at the uh, end of FP 2020, 
felt like we needed to communicate um, some of the measurement learning. Uh, we did a series of measurement learning series briefs, uh, as well as webinars uh, on many of these uh, to support that messaging. Uh, many of you may have participated in, in some of those webinars, and I appreciate that. And thank you uh, for new audience. I always feel like there's a a need to remind people or bring people back to um, some of the things that we've previously done. So I encourage you to explore these. Um, and uh, these really set the stage for how we moved forward with FP 2030, the changes and transitions that were underway and are underway, and uh, and the continued work that we that we need to do. Uh, and with that, I'll uh, I'll start to transition to okay now with FP 2030. How are we continuing this uh, work to advance measurement uh, and advance data use? Next slide, please. Next again. So first, before thinking that you know we needed to completely overhaul everything uh, with the transition to the FP2030 partnership, we really did ask the community uh, through a series of uh, surveys, webinars, focus groups, um, what has worked well? What uh, should we continue with? Uh, and and what things need to change? The PME working group also, one by one, went through the core indicator framework and assessed each indicator and said, um, is this still relevant? Do changes need to be made? Um, should we delete some indicators? Should we add some indicators? And so um, the, the starting point was the lessons um, and what we heard from the community. And um, people felt like you know, key lessons and key things that we that we did correct were a starting point. Um, so the we heard from the community that the focus on all women was uh, critical for a rights-based uh, family planning approach, uh, FP20. 20 always reported and asked countries to report on contraceptive use among all women. We recognized that countries, um, however, didn't always have all women uh, modern contraceptive prevalence goals. Uh, sometimes they had all women. Sometimes they had married women goals. Uh, so we felt like while reporting on all women was still critical, we needed to break down the component parts. Uh, we now report on modern contraceptive prevalence uh, on all women, married women, and unmarried women, and you can get those modeled estimates uh, from 2012 to the uh, to the year of the last report, <clears throat> which was last year's report, 2022. We moved away from reporting on additional users, which uh, wouldn't give you necessarily the baseline of total users. We always communicated about the the baseline of total users. But in shifting away from the FP 2020 goal of additional users, we just explicitly moved to the total users as our um, as our measure of quantum or our measure of the the, the amount of services that are being provided um, to clients, uh, and so that is now available. And we also focused um, while we were focused on uh, and remain focused on. Uh, expanding modern method availability and choice, um, we recognize that there are important dynamics happening in countries around traditional method use. And uh, we we felt like we needed to understand, not just understand, but also bring visibility to that traditional method use. And so you will now find uh, reporting on traditional method use uh, in uh, countries where it's greater than uh, 5% of the, of the prevalence. So now for countries uh, where traditional method use is uh, common, you can see that across, uh, across all of the, the reporting countries. Next slide, please. I mentioned that important uh, updates had been made to particular indicators, and we continue to make updates in the way that we report on the indicators and on um, the visibility or availability of additional uh, indicators. So um, that remains a test, you know, just giving poor people more data, more breakdowns, and more aggregation or disaggregation of uh, of some of the indicators, such as the the source of method. So you can now um, 
find the source of method, which is a public versus a private breakdown. And you can look at that by method uh, in every country for which we have available data. Uh, we also wanted to bring light to the fact that um, all of the estimates that we are working with have uncertainty intervals. They have uh, confidence intervals or plus minus around them. And so bringing literacy to the fact that a point estimate um, is a range, actually, um, a point estimate is within a range, uh, is important for understanding in countries, you know, why um, you, if you have two surveys, they may not be, you know, one may be slightly lower than another. And you say, well, does this reflect a lack of progress? Well, not necessarily if they are within the confidence intervals. Um, in understanding that is, I think, critical to, um, to data literacy and to data use. And critical also um, to the FP2030 um, it, measurement agenda has been the increased availability of adolescent um, youth sexual and reproductive health uh, data. And uh, we have a whole set of supplemental adolescent youth indicators that are beyond just modern contraceptive use. They include uh, <clears throat> age at uh, first sex, age at marriage, and age at first birth along with the adolescent birth rate and uh, contraceptive use. Uh, this is really important to understanding key life events uh, and, and those are all available on the, uh, on the FP2030 website and in some of our data dashboards. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna go through this. Uh, this is a set of, uh, this is the current measurement framework or the current set of, of country indicators. So uh, we now report on uh, 20 to 25. There are a lot of sort of breakdowns of these. So I don't, I don't actually provide a single number of indicators. Um, many of them are the same uh, with some adjustments. And there are some new ones, as I mentioned. And we're continually examining these and saying, you know, are these, are these providing the information um, that countries need um, and donors need and the global community needs? to understand uh, progress. Next slide, please. That bottom up approach uh, has not changed uh, for countries that make commitments to FP2030. Uh, there is the opportunity of technical assistance from the Track 20 project. Uh, the scope of countries, however, has changed. Uh, in the FP2020 era, I mentioned uh, that there were there was a focus on 69 uh, poorest countries, uh, and that was based on GNI per capita in 2010. And those 69 countries were set. Um, even if GNI uh, was uh, per capita was changing and we knew that uh, income levels were changing, that was the uh, basis for the partnership, and that, that was not reopened. Uh, there were a few countries, however, who did make, um, who did request to make commitments, and that that were outside the 69. And that that sparked the idea that, you know, the 69 countries is, is limiting. And in the FP2030 uh, transition, we did away with uh, that barrier. And really at this point, any country uh, can make a commitment to FP2030. And we encourage commitments from, we're trying to encourage commitments from Latin America, which are largely in the upper middle income uh, range. We are looking now to Pacific Islands, uh, we're looking to Central Asia, North Africa, uh, countries that fall outside of those original 69. Uh, that, in terms of reporting, um, brought up some tricky questions. You know, do we do a family planning report for the entire world? Um, well, then we get into data availability issues um, and data alignment issues. Uh, that we we have not resolved yet. So as a starting point, uh, the PME working group together with uh, FP2030 leadership decided we would start with a family planning report on the 82 low, uh, low income and lower middle income countries. That doesn't mean that countries outside of that range can't make commitments and countries have. We now have commitments from uh, Namibia from uh, Botswana, and we are now including those countries in the measurement report. So we will have those uh, countries included in this year's measurement report. 
At the same time, uh, the World Bank is uh, each year changing their their categories of income. So how do we handle that? Well, we are now incorporating um, any country that uh, through that transition process falls into the low uh, and low middle income countries. So this year, Jordan unfortunately slipped downward into the lower middle income category. Uh, so we are now including uh, Jordan. So we are adapting this uh, each year as uh, things change. Uh, we will never drop a country out of measurement. So if a country does move up a category, uh, we will continue to report on, on um, family planning indicators in that country. But this is something, I mean, these are the measurement challenges that we face. Uh, the next tier, you know, why not just do upper middle income countries? Uh, we know that that brings in <clears throat> almost double the number of countries or another um, 60 to 80 countries that would be added. Um, and we would be doing a measurement report for, you know, 150 odd countries um, each year. Um, and so we have chosen this um, and are welcome to feedback and, you know, other suggestions of, of how to do this. Uh, next slide, please. The FP2030 measurement report process um, remains the same. This idea that we um, that the conversations should be happening in country uh, and that our goal of the measurement report is actually data use at a country level. Uh, the measurement report is not itself sufficient and countries need to be reviewing uh, their data and deeper data than just the country indicators. Uh, we now have uh, FP2030, I hope you know by now, now has regional hubs, and that is a new uh, a new transition, a new architecture that we're working with as well. Uh, we are providing space in each measurement report for regions to determine uh, thematic priorities they want to analyze and, and focus on that year. Uh, and so we want to broaden the tent for participating in that theme selection, which we have largely done uh, through the FP2030 and Track 20 teams each year. Um, and this also provides us with an opportunity to, to continue to uh, move forward with uh, a conversation beyond just the acceleration of growth that was largely a conversation of FP2020. Uh, and you know we know regions like the Latin America and Caribbean region um, will have different conversations around adolescent and uh, adolescent pregnancy around uh, method availability, where the method mix looks very different. And so it creates that opportunity. And, and we're actively working with our regional hubs right now to, um, to shape that. Next slide, please. We also are trying to reimagine the report itself and the resources available um, to the global community and to countries. Um, I've mentioned the regionally led identification of themes. We're going to be working on new data visualization center with uh, data dashboards and resources that improve on the past, uh, increase access and availability, and just, gosh, my own available, my own ability to find the res the great resources that are available on uh, the FP2030 and Track20 uh, websites and uh, and other partners' websites. So we are uh, trying to uh, improve this user experience, uh, and I look forward to. Um, to unveiling new resources uh, in 2024 um, and creating new a, a new digital space for connecting a lot of the dots uh, for partners on family planning data, financing commodities and markets. So our hope is to create, I won't say it's a one-stop shop. I mean, I know we use that term um, too loosely, but we wanna create a place where we can connect through um, two other partners' reports, um, knowing that the FP2030 report um, depends heavily on other resources and other partners, and we want to make sure that everybody understands that architecture and the data ecosystem for family planning. Next slide, please. So in terms of family planning measurement advancement, um, I mentioned these examples on the right previously, um, and I'll say my goal, you know, why am I here today? I mean, it is really to urge you all to to participate in this process. I think we recognize and we have um, faced criticism, I, as, I would say as a family planning measurement community for moving slowly, um, that our progress on measurement and um, has been 
has been slow. Um, it, it's often organic, you know, it's just kind of what people are feel like working on or have funding to work on at a particular point in time. Um, sometimes in our case, it depends on the composition of the PME working group. Um, it can depend on meetings that are potentially happening. And I would say that a lot of the times these co these conversations and these efforts are fragmented and they're diffuse. They might be happen at a UAPS meeting. There's one conversation. There's this UAPS FPSRHR panel in which you're talking about family planning, data and measurement. We have ICFP, great conversations spread across a very large conference. Uh, we have a once at, you know, every four years IUSSP meeting. And we have a, a meeting in the U.S., the Population, Population Association of America, where great conversations happen. But, you know, how do we, how do we do better than that? How do we create a little bit more of an organized process? How do we identify those most critical measurement challenges and accelerate the solutions? I think that is that's the challenge ahead of us. Like we've made the progress that I discussed. This is the progress um, that I think we need to tackle now. Next slide, please. So the Performance Monitoring and Evans Working Group is talking a, a lot about how to accelerate this process, how to continue forward with a new measurement agenda um, that um, I would say improves, builds upon what we've done and improves upon our measurement. And, and we're hearing, you know, contraceptive prevalence isn't, um, isn't necessarily the focus of all of our community. Um, we know donors are looking at other possible measures. Uh, we know that the gender uh, community is looking at empowerment, agency, autonomy, how those relate to gender equality and how family planning plays a role in that. Uh, there have been great conversations this year on maternal health and uh, ending preventable maternal and infant mortality. And, and then we get questions about, well, how does one measure um, family planning's contribution to that? Um, is it just through universal access? Is that our ultimately our best measure of our contribution to ending pre preventable maternal mortality? Um, can we provide aligned measures on postpartum and post-abortion family planning? I will tell you that there are there are definitional issues. Uh, if you ask one person what is postpartum family planning, you ask another person. I, in fact, you guys can go ahead and, and play this game. You know, if you put in your chat, what do you think postpartum family planning is? Um, how would we measure progress towards that? I, I suspect we would get a number of different answers in the chat. And we know donors um, are uh, focusing on fertility intentions. And there was a, a, a good um, recent post by uh, Ann Stars from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on fertility uh, intentions or intention to use family planning um, in particular, not just fertility intentions, but intention to family plan and use family planning uh, recently uh, posted uh, and I uh, in LinkedIn and in other sources that I encourage people to read. Next slide, please. So I wanted to introduce you all to an idea that we, um, uh, we FP2030, uh, the Momentum Knowledge Accelerator Project and Gates Institute have begun uh, discussing and have begun organizing. And that is the idea of a more focused family planning measurement summit in 2024 and a series uh, and I call the series, these is, I, I suspect these will take the form of small group work on identified measurement challenges. Um, so what we want to do is expand engagement in measurement advancement. Uh, we want to um, bring together various stakeholders in the family planning measurement community um, to identify what those, those challenges are, which ones of them are, are you know, near-term wins uh, and where we could see change. Uh, where also there are medium and long-term investments needed. And so what we hope to do with this is to foster and incubate uh, small working group uh, discussions with a clear path towards um, actionable recommendations, uh, continuing work and analysis, indicator improvement, survey, question additions, uh, model adjustments as well. Um, and I know um, I know some of you are already participating in some small working groups that have been incubated out of uh, previous uh, PME working group and um, and other partner 
conversations like this. So this is our hope for the year ahead. I want to introduce that idea here and say that um, there is a landscaping analysis plan for the next several months uh, in which we will be we'll be asking the family planning community, uh, measurement community in particular, about data and measurement challenges um, towards this goal of, um, of a summit and series starting in, uh, in spring of 2024. I think with that, I am coming to the end. Thanks. I went a little longer than I'd hoped, but I hope I have provided you with um, some uh, some provocative questions, um, and uh, I haven't been monitoring the chat, so I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go in there. And I don't see that the webinar chat necessarily is active, so if it wasn't, I apologize. Um, but please do post any Q and A at this point, and um, I believe Akani has mentioned that we. You can raise your hand, I believe, if that um, if you would like to ask a question as well. Thank you so much, Jesse. I know we have a lot of people. Thanks for the brilliant presentation. I think people have questions, and also I know some people want to use the chat. So please, if you can enable the chat, and also for those who want to make uh, contributions or questions or comments, please, if you can just signify by raising up your hand, uh, then only we'll. Uh, enable you to speak. Thanks, Akani. So I do see a question in the chat <clears throat> about um, the question uh, says, uh, can you clarify how you decide on which countries for which to report data? Uh, do they have to have made a commitment or just to be eligible to make one? Uh, so any country is eligible to make a commitment. And therein lies a little bit of the problem of, um, should, you know, if any country can make a commitment, uh, should we be doing a family planning uh, data or measurement report uh, for the entire world? Um, so we didn't have a good, uh, we didn't we didn't feel like we could do that. We had the resources to do it, and that it might that it would be useful uh, for the community. So we chose, and we had to make a, cho a choice um, to report on all low and low middle income countries uh, as a starting point, regardless of whether they had made a commitment. So not all low and low middle income countries have made a commitment. Uh, approximately 40, I don't have the exact number at hand today, but approximately 40 countries have made um, a commitment. And uh, we report on those commitment making countries as well as all other low and low middle income countries. But if countries um, outside of that group of 82 have made a commitment, then we also uh, will add them to the uh, family planning measurement report. And that's where I brought up um, Namibia, an upper middle income country as an example. They made a commitment. We now have a, um, a country data sheet and all of the indicators with, uh, with caveat that you know not all indicators are available in all countries. Uh, and so we do our best with the data available. And so now Namibia is included in this year's uh, measurement report. Um, and uh, and so that's the starting point. I hope that, that's clear. <clears throat> There's a question about your view on traditional methods in Africa countries. Uh, yeah, do you think you. this is increasing? Yeah, OK. Thank you. Uh, for the question. So um, do we see increases in use of traditional methods in African countries? Uh, we've actually looked at trends in traditional method use. And shame my uh, colleague, uh, she's uh, uh, Farid is not online at the moment. She's attending another meeting. Um, we have not actually seen increases in traditional methods. Um, over you know, if you look over a, a two decade period and even the 2012 to 2020 period, uh, in general, we see a decline in traditional method uh, use um, in, in all countries. There are still some countries where traditional method use uh, is prevalent, uh, quite common. Uh, and in some countries uh, outside of Africa, it's actually um, higher percentage. Um, 
but that is at an aggregate. So that's looking across the entire country. Um, we do know that there are, if you look at traditional method use, uh, disaggregate that um, and you bring up um, highly educated or high, um, you could look at high, uh, or higher income quintiles as well. We do tend to see pockets of traditional method use in highly educated and uh, higher income populations. Um, that um, I can't say that that has increased over time, um, but it does remain um, important, um, an important dynamic to look at. Uh, you know, we I think many of you will know uh, that that is common in in Ghana um, and has been for a long time, but it's it is striking in other countries as well. Uh, we did some analysis this on this in a previous uh, measurement report. I believe it was the 2021 measurement report. In fact, we looked at traditional method use in different populations. So encourage you uh, to look at that. And uh, thank you, Yassine, for um, starting to post some of those uh, links. I see that maybe the chat wasn't open earlier, but I do appreciate that. Um, I do see a q and I'm going to turn to the Q&A pod. Um, and I see a lot of questions there. I'm going to try to um, move through those uh, pretty quickly. Um, I think uh, I answered the question on eligibility and which countries report data on from, from Anne. Thank you, Anne, for that question. Uh, I see a question on um, the AYSRHR indicators and how those were decided upon. A great question. We um, we worked with um, we worked with a. Uh, this is I'm trying to remember the years. I believe in uh, in around 2017, uh, WHO uh, and FP 2020 and uh, a project um, at uh, based at the Carolina Population Center, full access, full choice, brought together a uh, a group of, um, I would say about a hundred people working on adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health programs, uh, talked about measurement challenges and measurement gaps. And through that process, uh, one produced a commentary on uh, the gaps in AYSRHR data that um, is available uh, on our website, and then talked about what could we report on that would fill in some of those gaps. Um, and so, the selection of indicators that was chosen was really based on current availability. Um, it is not a perfect set or a complete set, but it was based on what could we start to do to improve uh, upon the available data. Many of you know that for the SDGs, the adolescent birth rate is one of the SDGs. It was one of the MDGs as well. But it doesn't really give you insights into adolescents and youth and their behaviors and their needs and their and their life events. Uh, it is only an outcome. And so it doesn't tell you what you should be focusing on. And that was something we wanted to overcome. Still needs more work. Um, and uh, I would say this is an area where we uh, constantly get uh, asked questions about what more uh, we could do. <clears throat> uh, hands up. I think there's Sam Seller. Sam, sorry. If Sam ahead. can just, okay, Sam, please. Uh, okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, hi, Jason. It's good to see you again. Um, so uh, I'm wondering how you're thinking about indicators, or if you're thinking at all about indicators related to laws and policies around enabling family planning access. I, I know that traditionally the, the focus of, of FP2020 and, and now FP2030 has been on quantitative indicators to really understand uh, uh, family planning uptake um, and, and access. But uh, you know the, the policy environment um, impacts so much uh, those those indicators. Are you thinking about trying to uh, quantify or qualify that in any way uh, across time? Over. Thanks, Sam. A great question. Um, in fact, since the beginning of uh, of FP twenty twenty, we have you know thought about uh, how could we. Um, provide additional data on the enabling environment for family planning, including the policy environment, accountability environment. Uh, for a long time, um, USAID funded the 
um, Family Planning Effort Index, uh, which was a policy-based um, uh, survey done with key informants in countries. Uh, that work was actually transitioned to something called the National Composite Index on Family Planning, um, or NCIFP. It has been done periodically by um, Avenir Health. Um, I believe we have three iterations of the NCIFP. Um, it, it is done in a similar way to the FPE in which um, it assesses policies, um, accountability. And when I say accountability, we're talking about, you know, are there mechanisms for um, reporting coercion and, and, and rights violations? You know, these are these type of accountability uh, systems. Uh, and, you know, restrictive policies or enabling policies. Um, that work has continued, but it is, it has fully, you know, been dependent on um, the resources and investments from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, to the Track 20 project. So in terms of, you know, our critical dependencies, I will say that uh, the Track 20 project remains a critical partner to us. And um, we you know, we've been watching closely changes within the foundation and the family planning data team. And we are aware that a lot of these things are dependent on uh, on those partners. Now, I said I wanted to bring greater availability or we want to bring greater availability um, to the um, resources available. This is one where I think, you know, we can, you know, we we need to bring greater light to that great work by uh, Avenir Health and the Track 20 project and, and, you know, make, I guess, you know, we call it signposting so that you know you know where to find that sam and i uh, hope that um that's helpful thanks um and thanks emily i'd see you're online i didn't know you were here so um you know if i'm uh if i'm incorrectly characterizing anything you are i always i think jacob has a question uh i don't know if jacob please if you can mute yourself and speak it'd be good to hear your voice I think that's a question from Jacob. I'm trying to look for it. Um, I see Jacob has been um, added to the screen. So Jacob, if you want to, you can unmute. There you go. No, I think, thank you. The, the question has been answered by Emily. So I was thinking that you have really done a fascinating presentation and exposition on FP 2020-2030 measurement processes, the role of uh, um, the PME working group and all the plans for the future. I think they are really very exciting. So I was thinking that, you know, when we talk about MCPR at a country level, we all know the reporting very useful, but then at country level, uh, we need to see what happens be, be, below so that countries can see where progress is, where things are lacking at sub-national level. What Emily said, those have been produced that they are being used at country level. So even those of us who are looking at national uh, level report, we don't get to see that. Maybe, and I think maybe on the website of Track 20, those will be available. Maybe there should be a way to allow others to have access to this or at least be publicized, publicized uh, widely for people to see. So yeah. I, th I think it's th this, these are, Great resources. I think they should be more widely available. So uh, it's not only MCPR. I can, can see the same thing for other indicators as well. But I just yeah. started with MCPR. So thank, thank you. Thank you I, I think I'll stop there. <laughs> thank you, Jacob, and thanks for Emily, Emily for chiming in. And I think that's an exact. That's the exact point that we're trying to make, which is we can only put so much in the in the measurement report each year. Um, you know, it becomes very difficult to get the same depth that countries, um, we know countries are using. And so, as Emily mentioned in the chat, uh, countries are using that data, they're examining it. Um, we may not put that in the measurement report. The measurement report serves as the annual, I'll say the annual encouragement to review that data. Um, we know it isn't sufficient and that that's why countries really do need to focus on this process. Um, Lastly, I think there's a question from Shola, if you want to hit that quickly, very close. Second, data we made available for researchers for further research work. Uh, so all of the data, um, so all of the data are available on the FP twenty thirty website. At least at a con the country reporting, we have uh, Excel file, downloadable by indicator by country, um, very much available for you. 
Um, if you have additional data requests, um, please do reach out to us. Um, uncertainty estimates are available as well. Uh, and uh, we encourage uh, more data use. Uh, we are looking at, uh, as I said, new formats and new data visualizations and, and availability. So we'll be working on that, but we have always produced and will continue to produce that uh, that Excel file uh, for users. Um, and so happy to provide that. Um, and uh, thanks, Akani, for, um, I, know, I see there are lots of great questions. I just want to say there is one question I want to say is on how do people get um, involved in it, this conversation uh, more generally. Um, we will be advertising more about the Family Planning Summit and continuing series. Um, we are really trying to encourage uh, country engagement, really more participation from the UAPs and from uh, partners in the countries uh, where this family planning measurement is most relevant. And so please stay tuned. We'll work with UAPs and Akani and the FPSRHR panel to uh, to promote and dis uh, disseminate those opportunities, uh, as well as through uh, ICFP and other, other formats uh, and FP2030. So thank you for the opportunity to, to encourage all of you to participate. It's now um, our job to to make that um, to to make that possible and, and make it true. Thank you. Thanks so much, Justin. Thanks for this brilliant presentation and also for the engagement. Uh, sincerely, want to appreciate you on behalf of the you know of Africa Population Studies, and we we're looking forward to I mean more partnership with the FP twenty thirty at the organizational level. Thanks so much. Again, to thank all our participants for. Uh, your time and for the contribution to this. I saw that Stacy is here. Stacy gave the lecture last month. Stacy, thanks so much. And the next lecture will be given, I mean, just block your debate, the last Wednesday of every month. We want to have just one hour of engagement. So for next month, we'll be given by one of our colleagues uh, with UNFPA, Dr. Chilanga Asmani. I also saw that it's around. Dr. Chilanga, we greet you. So we greet everybody and um, Again, looking forward to this very interesting conversation uh, on an, another topic next month. So thanks so much, uh, everybody. We appreciate it. Thanks and bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jason. I mean, that's, that's, that's good. Yeah, so we make it available on our website, the, the lecture with PDF it, and we make it available. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Thanks.